So this is the art of fermentation. The reason why I call it the art of fermentation is because it really turns out to be like your own work of art. Every individual, every home has their own microbiome, right? And that will change up the flavor a little bit. So your own flavor may be a little bit different than what you're sampling tonight or the flavor that I create. Mm -hmm. And it's really fun just to experiment. And it's a wild ferment that we're doing. So all we are mixing is sea salt and cabbage. That's it. And that encourages the beneficial microbes that are all around us, our invisible allies, to come in and cultivate and ferment in your jar. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> I'm going to get started as I kind of talk about my own personal healing journey and how I got started with making these fermented foods. So I, what I did um, initially is I cut the, the end of your cabbage and then I'm going to cut it in half. I'm just explaining what I'm doing before I get talking and chopping. And you want to remove the cabbage core. And what I like to do with the cabbage core is I keep it for, you can ferment this if you want to, or just compost it, throw it out. But it's a little fibrous, so I like to remove that so we do a cultured mama. And then and these, all these instructions will be on your guide, so you don't have to write them down if you don't want to. And then what I like to do is save a cabbage lid that's gonna go on the top to keep everything submerged. So that is what I'm doing here. Uh, so where did this all begin? Um, oh yeah, so I had stomach problems most of my life. Um, you know, being born in the late 80s, um, you know, there, there was a lot of fast food preservatives in my diet. My parents really didn't know any better, so they both worked full time and they did a lot of convenience foods in my household. And when I'd say over at friends' houses, I would often have stomach pains from eating their food and I just, I didn't have a really strong gut. And that was just a normal thing for me when I was little, I didn't know any better. And I coped with it, I still had a lot of energy, uh, but it, it definitely was a, a painful burden. And, um, oh yeah, acne medication as a teenager. I had really bad acne probably from my lack of probiotics in my gut and my microbiome. And um, then I traveled to, oh yeah, I was diagnosed, uh, with, oh first, before I, before I diagnosed myself with irritable bowel syndrome, I went to Guatemala to, uh, uh, with a, a language immersion program and uh, because I was lacking probiotics in my gut, I, um, I got really sick over there and the medication they gave me, the antibiotics, essentially burned a hole in my intestines and I got uh, really, really sick. I actually had a near-death experience over there and when I was lying there in pain, I was praying to God, you know, spare me, I'm, I'm 19 years old, I'm too young to die. And, if you do that for me, I will do good for you. I promise. Just, just you know, spare me. And then I went back into my body, and I, I went back to the United States, and I just, I was not the same. I either had pain from hunger or pain from eating foods, and something just was not right. And I went to my acupuncturist, and she is the first one that suggested I eat sauerkraut. She said, oh, yeah, it's super easy to make. And you can make this at home. And I was like, what, sauerkraut? I, the only association I had with it was, you know, sauerkraut on a hot dog. And I Googled how to make it when I had some downtime. And I, you know, figured it out. I made a big mess. But I put it in a jar and put it in the pantry and kind of forgot about it. And I found it a couple months later. <laughs> and I opened it up, it smelled okay, and I took a bite, and it was like dormant taste buds had awoke, awoken. And I almost ate the whole jar. It was like, wow, this is what I need in my gut. And it was, you know, just, I was obsessed. 
uh, ever since that, and I joined a Facebook fermentation group. I emailed Sandor Katz, who's known as the godfather of sauerkraut, got his book, asked him about you know certain questions. He emailed me back. I was amazed, and there's just an incredible community culture and surrounded these traditional foods. So that's my own personal story. Um, I healed my gut essentially with these foods. They're very inexpensive and easy to make at home when everything else failed me. I was also working in a supplement department at a health food store and I was trying everything, researching, and it was thanks to these foods that I got my gut back, my life back. As we know, health, healthiness is happiness and we often take health for granted and now when I share these foods with others, I hear incredible testimonials. My kids are healthy. This is really the missing link to our modern diets. So a rich history of sauerkraut. I was uh, doing some research for this class three years ago and uh, discovered Captain Cook, who was this famous, um, well, I, I don't know if he was a pirate. He was a sailor and he, you know, scurvy was a really big epidemic for sailors and, and um, you know, a lot of transportation was, you know, taking a boat and trade and commerce was about taking a boat and sailing across the seas. And scurvy was a horrible, horrible disease that's caused from a vitamin C deficiency. And there was a, a physician in England in the, I believe it was the 1800s, and he told Captain Cook that he should put in his, on his ship sauerkraut, barrels of sauerkraut, because they're rich in vitamin C. The fermentation process unlocks those nutrients, and cabbage is high in vitamin C, and it keeps, it preserves. So, you know, when other things like lime would, would spoil or other vitamin C rich foods, the kraut, which we have a lime kraut, that would, you know, keep when they would be months and months on, on uh, you know, sailing the seas. And there was also this one story I read that um, a big storm came in and a, a lot of the sailors on this one expedition, they got injured and they actually applied a poultice of sauerkraut and cabbage onto the wounds and it prevented those wounds from going uh, uh, to severe infection. So uh, this cabbage is such an incredible healing plant or vegetable I should say and fermenting it will unlock those nutrients and as it naturally preserves in the jar and also preserves your life and vitality. Um, and there's traditional fermented foods all over the world. There's kimchi and in, in Asian countries in Korea, there's over 500 different recipes of making kimchi. It's, it's basically savory, spicy, often with Napa cabbage. We have a kimchi in Culture Mama. Uh, you often will add red peppers, and there's a lot of fun recipes for that. In, uh, in Korea, the tradition is if uh, for a, a newlywed couple, a wedding present is often a kimchi vessel, fermented vessel to the newlyweds to uh, bless their marriage with good luck. I thought that was kind of neat. And uh, Cortido in South America is also a kind of a spicy, savory cabbage. Uh, we also have beet kvass, which is kind of similar to our spice beet in Russia. And these foods are not only delicious and traditional, but they helped our ancestors get through the winter when there wasn't fresh produce available to keep them healthy and to keep them uh, from starving. And it's a, a natural preservation method. So this, is, this was invented because we didn't have refrigeration or we didn't really know much about pasteurization. And these foods naturally are preserved with the sea salt. So pretty amazing rich history 
and it connects us to the past. And like I said before, I believe that these foods are kind of the missing link to the, the, the modern day gut health problems that we have. So I just started getting this in the bowl and I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Um, so what's really cool, there's a lot of health benefits to these foods. A really amazing fact is that we are more bacteria than stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Imagine that each of you has more different bacteria collectively than stars in the Milky Way galaxy. There are invisible allies. In fact, latest forensic science, they are able to figure out in a crime scene who was actually in the room during the scene of the crime based on the bacterial profile of the room. So all of us being in here, we introduced all of our different uh, beneficial bacteria and they, they are our invisible allies. Yes, and when we're born, we have a perfect microbiome. We get it through the birth process, through our mothers, uh, through breast milk, and through stress and other factors that can compromise our gut, environmental factors, uh, pesticides, antibiotics, those good allies get stripped and just like me with my healing journey in Guatemala, when I went to Guatemala, those good bacteria were stripped from the antibiotics I was on for acne, you know, my acne medication. So the foreign bacteria in Guatemala had a chance to invade and and you know overtake my my gut and, and essentially it made me ill. Um, so yeah, we're more bacteria than human cells. It's pretty amazing to think about because we don't see them. But these foods can encourage the beneficial bacteria to cultivate in your gut and last. Health benefits continue. So not only are you gonna get probiotics, you're also gonna get prebiotic fiber in the, the cabbage and um, I'm gonna pause here really quick and I'm gonna add my sea salt, okay? So I chopped up some of my kraut, not all of it. You can use a knife at home. I also use the S-blade on my Cuisinart food processor. If you don't have that, a good old fashioned knife works. Sharp, sharpened is best. And I like my kraut kind of chunky. You can make it extra thin. You could dice it up. It really doesn't matter. It just depends on what your preference is. And now I'm gonna add the sea salt. So I put on the, the sheet here on um, step 31, um, nine grams of sea salt per one pound of cabbage. Now, if you don't have a scale at home, such as this, I measured about a teaspoon and a half equals nine grams of uh, sea salt. Now, let me talk about the equipment really quick. Mixing bowl, uh, you want to avoid um, stainless steel or metal. It, it wouldn't hurt if that's all you have. Just don't leave it in there for too long or else it may oxidize or it will start oxidizing. I prefer glass. This bowl is something portable and um, it's plastic, but it's not going to be in here too long, so the plastic shouldn't leach. It's food grade. Um, you can use any size vessel if you have a food grade fermentation bucket, that's great. Um, as far as the salt goes, you can use Himalayan pink sea salt, Celtic sea salt. I happen to have Mediterranean sea salt. And um, you just want to avoid table salt because it has iodine in it, which will alter the flavor. So I'm going to go ahead and add my sea salt. Here I weighed three pounds of, of cabbage. So uh, that would be um, three times nine. Um, oh no, I'm sorry. I, this was uh, almost six pounds of sauerkraut. So this is gonna be about 50, uh, 50 grams of sea salt. So I'm gonna weigh that out. Now, 
When I first started making sauerkraut, I actually didn't even me measure my salt. I just kind of went to feel. You can't really mess this up. If you add too much salt, it will be a little bit slower and it's ferment and it will taste kind of salty. Uh, if you add too little, it may spoil. So as this starts mixing up together, you'll get the feeling of it creating its own juices and doing like a sweating process. And you'll also hear it kind of start doing, I like to call it the snap, crackle, pop effect, which knows that you know that you are getting that fermentation process going. You're, you're hearing aliveness as it start, mix, starts mixing together and creates that perfect environment. So here we go. Now we also are water. We have a lot of water, water molecules in our bodies, in our cells. And studies have shown that water responds on an energetic level. There's uh, this book we have called The Hidden Messages of Water. These Japanese scientists, they would look at the water molecule after someone would think or say hateful things or love and peace, and they would look at the water molecule, and they found these beautiful crystallized structures. They almost look like little snowflakes when people would say love and, and pray over the water versus the, the water that was you know full of hate and in hateful intention. It looked like shards of glass. So my point with that is that as I am fermenting, I like to pray over this and you know say positive affirmations, may this heal whoever eats it, and I like to infuse it with healing love. In Korea, they actually have a word, a verb, for food that is handcrafted or handmade. We don't have that, that word in our language, but you know what I'm talking about? You can taste love. You know, when, when mom makes you homemade chicken noodle soup when you're sick, it tastes different than store-bought. And it's because of your, of you know, whoever makes it their, their intention. And love is so powerful. I thought, why not, you know, preserve that intention into your fermented foods? So as I'm doing this, I'm kind of breaking up bigger pieces and this is kind of a fun part. If anybody wants to come up and get their hands dirty or in, I've got gloves. <laughs> uh, so that, that's the beginning process. See, it's already starting to glisten and mix in well with the salt. And to save you a little bit of time, you could you know, really massage in the sea salt and you could cover it with a dish towel or uh, something to you know, cover it from any bugs that may be in your house and then give it a rest and then come back and give it another massage. This will really help speed up the fermentation process. And uh, even if you have a really old cabbage in your fridge and you need to use it up, you can use it. <laughs> it just may not have as much liquid, but we can remedy that. And I can, I'll can i definitely go into that further along in the class. Um, health benefits. Okay, so I talked about the prebiotic fiber. So there is fiber naturally occurring in vegetables, right? A lot of us are not getting enough fiber in our diet. Uh, prebiotic fiber is full of inulin, which helps with blood sugar, and it also will feed the good bacteria, the probiotics. So I often say prebiotics may be a little bit more important than probiotics, or you definitely need the pre with the pro because these are the probiotics are living organisms, and just like anything living, they need to be fed. So they like to have that fiber that they break down, the, the starches like inulin 
and uh, the polysaccharides, they like to break down and, and uh, see, look, I'm already making a mess. Um, they, they definitely like to be fed. So the probiotics, uh, the lactic acid is why this starts to kind of taste like vinegar. Uh, I had one student one time go, wait a minute, you're telling me there's no vinegar in sauerkraut? I said, no, it creates basically its own vinegar, which is lactic acid. And then there, through the different stages of, of fermentation, there's other probiotics that get introduced, and that would be the lactobacillus, um, Acidophilus is another good one in certain ferments. And you can really geek out on these different probiotics and fermented foods and go online. And it's very fascinating, the, the research that's coming out recently on gut health and how important it is to eat fermented foods that our ancestors once ate you know, a little, and you don't need much. You just need a little portion with each meal every day. And it will really make a difference in your life. You ought to try it. Um, do you just eat it separately? Because I, 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 I never know what to use sauerkraut for. Great question. So I seldom eat it separately. My favorite way is to add it into salad, green oh. salads, with a good dressing because it adds that really nice tangy savory flavor. I also like to eat it as a side dish with eggs or a, or a breakfast. Um, my kids like grilled cheese sandwiches and once you cook the grilled cheese and you can add a little bit of it, it will, it will um, keep those probiotics active unless if you cook it above 105 degrees. So, um, or you could blend it up into a dip, like hummus. Um, I've even dehydrated it at a low temperature and add, and blended it up into a powder, or ground it up into a powder, and I made a savory seasonings to put on popcorn. So there's a lot of different ways you can consume sauerkraut other than just eating it plain. And then of course, on a hot dog. <laughs> Yes. So on the temperature note, I always throw sauerkraut in with like a apple or orange with pork and then eat it with like potatoes or something. Perfect. But I'm like worried about killing the probiotic, so... If you bring it to, you know, if, if it's not hot out of the oven, it should be okay. Okay, I was just yeah. pot pot how it's super hot. Yeah, that may be a little too hot and it's okay to cook this. A lot of German cuisine ha cooks it. You know, they'll make like a roll, a, a fried roll. Um, it just will kill the probiotics. So you'll, you will get the fiber, but you're gonna lose those probiotics in the, when it is introduced to heat. And that's why you don't wanna buy sauerkraut that's been pasteurized and found shelf stable at the store. It's delicious and that's great, but you're just not gonna get the, the probiotics. Is there a specific it. temperature, you know? So uh, through the fermentation process, is that what you're asking no, about? No, okay. when you heat it up before you start filling the probiotics. Um, you know, room temperature is best or, or colder. But like you, know, like, like you said, if you're heating it up on the stove or in the oven. That yeah, I would just avoid that. And if you're gonna eat it with something hot, just let that cool down first. And then you can either, you know, have the, the sauerkraut in a little bowl on the side and add it back then, or just take it with a bite and then a bite of your hot food. And um, this is already starting to drip and create its own juices. So that's a good sign. Um, you usually use gloves, like if you're making it for yourself. Oh, great question. Home. So if you don't have gloves, no problem, but your hands may start feeling kind of weird from the sea salt, kind of like pruney. <laughs> um, so I, I do like to wear gloves, but you don't have to. It, it may exfoliate your hands a little bit, but um, <laughs> but you can't really go wrong. Yeah, the kids love it. How long do you do that? 
Yeah, that's my problem. Because, um, you know, it's like once every half hour, do you just like do it for five or ten minutes and then come back a half an hour later? Yeah, you could do, do that. I mean, and even if you run out of time and you got to get it in the jar, right. no problem, right? I can even right. pack this right now. However, it still is not quite uh, liquefied yet, so okay. it's going to want to rise. Mm -hmm. So you want to allow some head space for that. Um, so at first when I started doing this, I would give it a lot of time, but I'm a mom, I work a lot, and I just, I kind of now know to feel when I've gotten it to that happy place to transfer to the jar. Does anyone want to come up and feel? So you can just do that until it's done and you don't have to do the every half an hour yeah, yeah. You'll, okay. you'll. Once you keep, do, once you start doing this, you'll, you'll know. Okay. It's, it's so foolproof. Okay, so here's some gloves. Yeah, these were from the kitchen. They're powder free, okay. talc free. So, yeah. So, um, just so you can get the feel for it. I made it super chunky, so it's not going to be as liquefied yet. But you can kind of feel that different texture than just a fresh chopped cabbage, yeah, right? Really like yeah, I'm really massaging it. It's kind of a good workout, actually. Yeah. <laughs> you can get pretty buff. I did 120 pounds yesterday. Um, um, you know, ideally about a half hour at the, the, at the max, but take breaks, right? Because it, it makes your hands a little tired. So, yeah. It is. It's getting juicy. Yeah, here's a trash can. <laughs> Thanks for being brave and coming up. So does it need that 30 minutes to rest in between? Just to rest your hands, okay. really. <laughs> uh, I'm just kind of trying to speed this up because we're we're here together and I want to get it nice and, um, oh, I'm hearing the snap, crack, and pop. So I'm going to, I want to come around so you guys can kind of hear it. Do you hear it? It's also nice that it tells you that it's... Yeah. Okay, we have a question. Yes. Um, is it the same process for other vegetables? Or how would you like Great question. Yeah, so... Um, like, say, harder vegetables, like, maybe like, 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 Right, yeah, so um, with carrots, if I add carrots into this, I'll just shred them with a cheese grater or make it nice and fine and just add it right in as is. With things like cucumber, anything, any vegetable that has a hard outside layer and a soft inside, it's going to require a different ratio of sea salt. And you will get that ratio if you go online and type in brine calculator. And that I think that I put that on the uh, number step number nine. Okay. Uh, but we'll get to that. We'll get into more details about that. Great question. Um, just really quick while we're on this slide, uh, our immune system, which is very important as we know with the current affairs going on in the world, uh, we create seventy percent of our immune system in our gut. Uh, so it's very important to get these fermented foods into your digestive system to assimilate the, the immune system, right? Um, emotional well-being. I was amazed to find out that 90% of serotonin, the feel-good hormone that regulates melatonin, phosphatidylserine, all of those um, hormones... They, the, the serotonin, 90% gets produced in our gut. Um, detoxification. Ingesting fermented foods will help your body eliminate harmful pathogens. They, don't, they can't stand these, these good guys, right? So I, I picture, you know, like a Star Wars scene in your gut where you have <laughs> these <laughs> probiotics and they have their lightsaber and they're shooting the bad guys and saying, hey, you are not allowed in this spacecraft. And, and then you can eliminate them. Another amazing fact is that it will help your body detoxify um, 
certain um, pesticides, um, glyphosate, uh, BPA found on receipt paper. We, it's ine inevitable that we are exposed to toxins in our environment, and this can help your body eliminate those toxins. Um, and then I also brush upon earlier the vitamin C, thanks to Captain Cook. He kind of created that healing modality way back in the day. It was documented in history. Um, also high in B vitamins. Um, I found that when I really started ingesting a lot of fermented foods, my sweet tooth went away. Things that weren't sweet before started tasting sweet, like coffee. Black coffee started tasting sweet. Um, so we've already kind of brushed upon how to ferment as we have been chatting. Um, there's many, many different ways to ferment. Um, traditionally, some cultures would take the bladder of an animal and stuff that with a fermented vegetable, you know, sea salt, which was, salt was what, you know, was very, was a precious commodity back in the day if it wasn't available where you lived. Uh, it was traded all over the world. Uh, they would often pack a bladder, clean out a bladder of an animal and bury it in the ground. Um, I found that the mason jar, any size works fabulous. This is a good size for my family, but you don't have to commit to such a large size. You could do a quart size jar, you could do a 16 ounce mason jar. Uh, find what works for you, and these are, you can often find used, you can reuse them. I have a big collection of mason jars, I use them for everything. Ask Holly, <laughs> I always bring a big jar of herbal tea every day to uh, work and then reuse the jar for kraut on another occasion. Uh, so this is, this is a pretty sustainable, low-tech way to get your probiotics and it's affordable, it's delicious. If you don't have time to do this at home, know that Culture Mama makes some amazing products, a flavor for each, uh, each profile, each taste bud, and we use all certified or organic ingredients. It's wholesome. And I think that the next slide is what you have on your paper. So we are pretty much done here. There's quite a bit of liquid in the bottom that, you, so I call this my pretty and pink kraut because it turns actually to this hot pink color once it ferments. So right now it's kind of purpley and white. But it's it because you mix the purple with the green cabbage? Yeah. Okay. And it's a great flavor too because uh, purple cabbage on its own or red cabbage, um, it, it's a little bit stronger in its flavor. It's kind of, it's like really almost bitter. And the green cabbage, I feel, has a little bit more sugar in it. So the combination is so beautiful, and it's such a beautiful color. It's, it's fun for the kids, too, to see that transformation in color. So that's one test I know. It's ready to go in the jar. Look at all that juice. We didn't add any water yet. All this is is sea salt and cabbage. I got these cabbages from our produce department. We have the best organic produce in town. Uh, however, they have done studies with vegetables that were sprayed with glyphosate. Fermenting them actually removed quite a percentage of mm -hmm. those chemicals. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty magical, amazing process. So these are your friends. You can get these in a canning um, kit. Um, I think they sell them at the beer and wine store. This will just help get it all in the jar. So I'm just gonna start packing it in. And another nice tool, but once again, it's not required, are one of these. My husband recently just got me this as a birthday present. And uh, my, my, I have pretty petite hands, I can get my fist in the jar, but this just saves you some effort there. What is that called? A stomper? Tamper, tamper, packer. Bring your own word up. He got this from the beer and wine store. Yeah, they, they come in all shapes and sizes. We actually don't even use these in Culture Mama because we are hardcore, but 
um, for home use, and they're they're fun. This is bamboo. They have you know all different colors, and you could probably get one that's got an emblem on it. Um, I'm I'm actually very happy now that I have this. Um, so I'm just gonna pack away, and sometimes I like to sing a little song when I'm doing this, and um, it's just a lot of fun. Um, you just make sure that you get it nice and tight. Why is that why nice and tight? What is that? Uh, so it will it will prevent the air gaps in it. So oxi oxygen is not our friend. Okay. Um, I put on our little handout that all this fine submerged under brine. That's my little mantra. And the reason why I say that is oxygen will spoil it. So you just want to avoid as much oxygen as possible. It probably will be fine if you get a little bit of air bubbles. That's inevitable, but this will also prevent it from rising up and wanting to overflow. So once again, um, this was about a medium-sized green cabbage, a little bit larger purple cabbage. I didn't use the whole green cabbage and I'm almost to where I want this to be packed. So what I like to do is I go to about the elbow of the jar to allow for that expansion as it rises. So that looks about right. I've made the mistake and overpacked it, which is fine, but you're gonna lose some of that liquid. So here's my beautiful purple liquid. I'm gonna pour that on the top very carefully without losing any. Okay, pack that down again. I have a question, Jessica. What if I was just really lazy when I <laughs> mixed the sea salt and the cabbage and only did it just for like five minutes and then packed it in the jar, what would happen? It would be fine. Okay. It just may want to really rise up and okay. kind of rise up and then condense. So it's not as controlled. Okay. So if you are super lazy, you're going to want to check it the next day and pack it down okay. and just watch it every day. Okay. This I like to set and forget. I don't want to have to worry about it every day. So I like to keep it at a controllable environment as such. Uh, you can see the little bubbles on the top that have formed and we are ready to do the final process. So here's my cabbage lids. I'm going to take my cabbage lid and tuck it in nice and tight into the mason jar and this will keep the cabbage submerged. Okay, now I can leave it like this, or, which we sell in Culture Mama, you can get one of these glass weights, and this will also encourage it to stay put under the brine. So, this is pretty much complete. As this ferments, more juice is going to be created, but I do like to top it with a little bit of water if I didn't get enough of that brine created. I do like to add a little bit of salty brine, which is simply sea salt and water. I may, yes, so chapter, I mean chapter, step nine, <laughs> you create a 2% brine solution, which is one gram of salt for one quart of water for a specific ratio. Sometimes I don't even count. I, I just don't even want to deal with it. So I'm just going to put a little bit of salt. I think I'm going to do about a little bit, half of a teaspoon in, in this size water. If it's too salty, don't fret. If it's not salty enough, no big deal. Some don't even add salt into it, but I do just to prevent any anything weird from developing into the, the top of your jar, okay? Now, no one has died of botulism from eating fermented food. This is a very safe food to eat. 
because you can clearly tell when it's gone bad. There are indications that it's not good to eat. It will smell off. You'll get mold on the top. Um, I just poured a little bit on the top. This may actually spill a little bit. I may have added a little too much. What I like to do at home is put a little uh, bowl or I like to use a glass pie dish for the bottom of this just in case if this um, overfills or spills out. Um, and that's okay. That means it's alive, it's active. Then you take your lid. Now this is something you can purchase online. We do sell them in Culture Mama. I think we're out of stock at the moment. Uh, we do sell them um, up front. I can look for you. Uh, this little airlock, this is called an airlock vessel. It sits on the top of a plastic food grade wide mouth lid with a little grommet. Is that what we call it? Grommet on the top. Now this airlock lid, you can find these cheap and reuse them. I added a little bit of water. Sometimes they're kind of stubborn and they don't want to open. So I won't try, but I filled up. There's a little uh, ring to know how much water to fill. This will create a completely airtight environment. It allows it to breathe, but it will prevent the oxygen from touching the kraut. Um, so then you set it and forget it for about three weeks, okay? Um, ideally, sauerkrauts and fermented vegetables, they like about 65 to 75 degrees. In the winter time, if your home gets a little bit colder than that, no big deal. It just slows down the fermentation process. So I actually let my kraut go a little bit longer in the winter time. Um, it, but I encourage you to taste it as it ferments because there's different probiotics that form as it ferments through those different stages of probiotics. So some actually like a younger ferment. Some like it to go three months. So I encourage you to taste it and see what it tastes like on week one. Taste it at week two. Week three is usually the happy medium, that sweet spot where a lot of lactic acid, lactobacillus probiotics have been, uh, have cultivated and create that savory, tangy flavor that we're familiar with. Um, I've had mine go for three months, but sometimes it gets a little bit softer and a lot of our preference is that crunch, right? We kind of like that little bit of a crunch to the ferment. But you really cannot go wrong with letting it go for three months, if not longer. And there will be clear signs if it's gone bad. Um, any questions? Do I have to soup it in the fridge? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so after um, the three weeks or however long you want to go, you can put it in separate smaller jars to give away as gifts or share with family and friends, or you can, I usually just jar this right up. So I will take this lid off and put a, a regular mason jar lid on there, remove the glass weight. You don't have to, but I do. Uh, or these often come with this little um, cork for the lid, or you can just leave it like this if you prefer, and then refrigerate it. And it's good for at least six months refrigerated. If you want to go old school, if you don't have one of those lids, oh, yeah. what do you do in that case? Do Great question. One? Yeah, uh, for years I didn't even buy one of these. I wanted to keep it really low tech. So what you do is just get a regular mason jar lid with the ring mm -hmm. and just loosely put it on the top. Okay. Or you're just gonna, you're gonna have to burp it every day like a baby to release that pressure. Okay. But I found just a little slight twist so it's loose um, can release that CO2 that formulates, which is basically the gas of these living things that they're, it's the byproduct of them cultivating and, and uh, fermenting. So that will, will release the CO2 but also prevent uh, too much oxygen from spoiling the kraut. I'm not sure what, what the purpose of the water in that is. Great question. So the water just prevents the oxygen from from going from this little straw into here. So it creates, there's a little uh, top, 
there's a, this little bobber. Mm -hmm. So it completely, make, they call it an air lock because it takes the air out of touching the inside of this. The linear outlet. Yes, yeah, so it lets CO2 out. Huh? There is a hole in the bottom of the little tube that you Yeah, can yeah, there's a, little, it, there's a little hole and then there's this little bobber uh -huh. that goes in there. So it's kind of a genius. It just makes it a lot easier where you don't have to check it and burp it. It's a really easy technology to use, but you don't have to have this. You can just use a regular mason jar lid, but you're gonna have to check it and make sure that it's not getting exposed to oxygen. What are these called? Huh? Okay. <laughs> what are they called? Uh, airlock vessel. Okay. Yeah. Um, just regarding the um, cabbage. So let's say you want to ferment different vegetables. Is it, so this is a two-fold question, so okay. it's a similar process, and it's also, if you ferment different vegetables, you will use different biomes of probiotics and different... Yeah, yeah different, different flavors, different biome. Uh, you will get some microorganisms found in the skin of the, the vegetable that you're using. Now, back to the, well, before I go into that, I'll answer your question in the back, and then we'll go into the other veggies. Okay, so I got a gift from Ohio, and it's a crop. Okay. With the weights. Yes. And the lid. Great. How does that work for burping or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that uh, technique we use for hundreds, yeah. thousands of years, because that's what we had. We didn't really have glass, we had ceramic. And I have worked with a crop, but there's gonna be a lot of oxygen exposure with that. Mm -hmm. So you just, you're gonna wanna check it and you may get some scum on the top and you're gonna wanna remove that and I don't like to deal with that. So try it. In Culture Mama, we used to use Crocs, but we don't anymore because you're just getting a lot of oxygen that sits on the top. Okay, that's what happens with my pickles and the pickles yeah. are not good. I mean, I just, yeah, so. You can definitely experiment with that. You just want to make sure that you have a lot of brine on the top, make sure it's submerged. And those ideally work better in a root cellar where it's a little bit colder and dark and not around uh, a lot of activity uh, or bacteria, right? Kind of in its own little closet. And it's more con in a controlled environment. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, veggies, um, so as I was mentioning before, any veggie that has a soft inside and hard outside, they can tend to go mushy. So you're gonna need a higher brine percentage, about 3.5% for pickles, if you leave them whole or if you, if you uh, slice them and if you quarter them, uh, you're gonna need a stronger brine. And the process is a little different if you're gonna do whole vegetables or a medley of vegetables, you pack them in your jar just like we did with the kraut, but then you add your brine. You're not doing anything, you're not adding sea salt to them in a, in, a, in a bowl. You're packing your veggies. You could add some savory herbs if you would like. Dried herbs are always best because the fresh herb can overpower the ferment with the flavor. You can add fresh, but you don't need much. I like to do dried. Um, you pack your veggies in nice and tight. Make sure that they're submerged. You can put another, you could put a lid, a cabbage lid over that and a glass weight. And then you pour your brine solution so they're completely submerged. And with that, you don't need as long of a fermentation process of, of three weeks. Mm -hmm. They're often good at about seven days. And beets, because there's a lot of sugar in them, they like to be about three to five days. And once again, just taste it as, as you go along with the process and it's simple and fun. Do you make a lot, do you make kibas as well? I have, yeah. yeah. That always gets moldy. Yeah, that's, that's an issue with kibas and um, you're just gonna have to, you know, remove a little layer of it each day and then pour some more brine solution on that. And kibas is a little bit more complicated than a beginner's course. So um, maybe I'll have to do a kvass class. So when you make your things like the um, cashew jalapeno dip, which yeah. is like crab, so <laughs> um, 
Do you just like ferment the individual vegetables and then blend it up together, or is that kind of how you would do that? Like, the, so the we um, for the jalapeno dip, you soak cashews. The cashew is the base of that uh -huh. dip, or you could use um, you could also use sprouted um, sprouted seeds like garbanzo or lentils. Blend soak those, blend those up. And then um, you can add some sauerkraut, blend it up, add a little bit of the juice. Sometimes I like to add the finished juice if I have leftover into a salad dressing. Mm -hmm. And it adds a really nice flavor and probiotics and minerals. But you're fermenting it all together, you're not like individually fermenting. Yeah, we're just taking fermented jalapenos and sauerkraut, fermented garlic. So everything's already been separately Everything's fermented. been separately fermented, and then you blend it all together the day of the party or gotcha. when you're ready to eat it. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I just have a question that you kind of already went over, but I just want to make sure I understand. Sure. Uh, when I did this once, I forgot about it. I put the lid on really, really tight. You said not to, so I put the lid on really, really okay. tight. And then when I opened it three days later, it, like, so much bubbling and like a like, volcano yeah and i thought i didn't know what happened i'm just wondering so what yeah if that I happens or... yeah so um just make it a little less tight last time or next time um and then it's still not bad once it loses a lot of juice but it probably lost a lot so you're going to want to re-add some more brine okay to the top Follow up question. Yes. I freaked out and just put it in the fridge. I was like, ah, oh, put it in the fridge and ate it, you know? So, yeah. what That's is fine. Like the. Like, yeah. is, it, like, is it still beneficial? Or yeah. do I not wait long enough to get, you know? Yeah, you may not get, you know, as uh, diverse of a probiotic profile because it's, okay. it's still so young. Okay. But you're still getting the benefits of the cabbage. And if it tastes good, um, <laughs> why not? Yeah, it's definitely not bad. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So you have to have the glass weight. You don't. Okay. Yeah, that and once again, I I did not. I used to not. Some people still, you know, years and years they don't bother with it. But so would you fill it a little bit higher than without the glass weight? Uh, I would just fill it so it's all submerged. So even with this taken out, it's submerged. But this just keeps it submerged as it wants to rise. Okay. So then you. Uh, Still with the cabbage leaf and then I'll put it on. Yeah. The cabbage leaf is really handy because it keeps the floaters from okay. rising to the top. So this is a low tech uh, lid, right? You could get a fancier thing, but might as well just, and then the lid, I eat the lids too. It doesn't, it's fine. <laughs> so when you're tasting every week or so to try it out. You're taking this whole thing off, and the you getting into it isn't creating any problems with like adding oxygen to it and everything like that. Yeah, just be quick and brief. Okay. You know, don't don't let it sit out all day. If you do, no big. If you forget about it, no big deal. Just just close it back up. Yeah, yeah. If I were making like the trying to do like the fermented carrots or something, would it be weird to use a cabbage lid? No, we do that at Culture Mama. Okay. Use, yeah, use a cabbage lid. If you get creative, if you have some. Uh, kale in the garden that's gone really, if it's bolted, use that. Use any, um, some people use grape leaves. Uh, grape leaves have tannin, tannins in it, which will help keep it crisp. So right? you guys make the carrots and garlic the fermented? And yeah. And basically just make them taste exactly like that. <laughs> so you yeah. Use cabbage leaves? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, cabbage leaves. Yeah, you can't go wrong. It's, <laughs> it's so, it's so nasty and low tech. So I encourage you to, you know, start with something simple like this. Another fun thing is the classic caraway where you add caraway seeds that also will, uh, the caraway is very, it's carminative, it's very warming. It also will help um, kind of acts like a, a preservation uh, because of that, uh, some of the antibacterial um, properties of the caraway seeds and that adds kind of a nice, German flavor, right? The green cabbage and caraway seeds is very classic. Um, experiment with other veggies to shred up and add. Um, because the more and more people that eat these fermented foods around us, the healthier collectively we all are. Um, 
there's a connection between the, the macro to the micro, us to the soil. It's, we have, we, we got to uh, cultivate that symbiotic relationship with the soil and the land and fermentation is a part of that process. Um, this is kind of that same full circle concept with what we consume. We eliminate and it will go back to our environment, the oceans, the soil, the air, the water. That can be a positive thing or a negative thing as we're seeing with pollution. But these microorganisms can help clean up our own personal environment as well as the earth. Um, as well as the microorganisms and the mycelium of mushrooms can also facilitate in that. So there's just this symbiotic relationship with our microbiome and the, the microorganisms that we find in our environment. Another, you know, full circle concept that we can either live in dis-ease by eating poor, poorly, um, or we can, you know, increase our well-being by ingesting these foods, um, and it all goes full circle with animal husbandry, growing our own gardens, uh, taking care of our environment, being stewards of the land. This all goes hand in hand. This is a really wonderful way, especially in the winter time when we're not getting our hands in the soil and and getting those microorganisms. This is a great way to preserve our health, to, to keep us healthy during the cold winter months. So what can we do? We can bring back the traditions. We can start fermentation clubs. I thought it'd be really fun to do a potluck. We could all bring our fermented foods and have a barbecue together and take, you know, do a little taste test with everyone. Um, there's a lot of online support. It's pretty incredible, this big trend that's going on. Uh, you know, 10 years ago when I started all of this, there wasn't much knowledge or I, it was harder to find my tribe, my community of, of uh, fermentistas, like a barista, but we're fermentistas, right? Now it's it's trending, kombucha, kefir, water kefir, uh, you know, of course, fermented vegetables, sauerkraut, it's, it's widespread and available. And we're so fortunate that we have a local health food store that it, that's making these foods because you can taste the difference if you buy the bigger brands because it, it's mass produced, right? There's something magical about homespun small batches and that magic gets a little lost in large production. Uh, consume these foods daily, share with others. Um, you know, when my kids were babies, I'd give them like a little teaspoon of the sauerkraut juice and just to get their taste buds used to it and they love it. And then when I have little kids come over to my house, I have them try it and they, they get the funniest look on their face. Kind of like, whoa, what is this flavor? Like, what do I do with this? But I just, I really want to share it with others. Um, we also sell these books here at Pilgrim's Market. Um, this one here, Fermented Vegetables, it's kind of hard to see on the slide. It's by <laughs> Shopee is their last name. Um, this one is really cool to keep on hand because they have a, a, um, a trial or a, 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 a guy that has your kraut gone wrong. And one time my kraut turned kind of gelatinous as I was lifting it up, it, it, it was like gelatinous, like glue. And I'm like, what, is that bad? And that usually will correct itself as it ferments and it's not bad. So I, I would assume it's bad, but sometimes the sugars and just the way the art of fermentation sometimes can create some weird effects. But through through their, um, their trial and error um, page or whatever uh, chapter in the book, I was able to figure out, oh, that's just a part of the process. It's not desirable, but it's not bad. Uh, Sandra Katz, uh, Wild Fermentation, Art Fermentation, I would love to have him come and speak here. He lives in Tennessee. Maybe in the future we can get him to come and speak. Uh, there's some incredible documentaries on Netflix or the World Wide Web that 
interview Sandor Katz and many other fermentistas. What was that called? The Netflix. I believe the Netflix documentary I recently watched was called Ferment. Mm -hmm. Just type in Ferment. And uh, this, this, doc, uh, this journalist or cinematographer, he goes all over the world and interviews people. And there's someone, you know, making crowd, just like I was making crowd. And it's pretty cool that, it, you know, this is all globally happening and making our world a healthier, happier place. So that's what I have for you. So, do you think you can do that? Well, um, is that beets up there? You can ferment beets. Oh yeah. I love beets. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we have the spice beet brine, but beets are a wonderful thing to ferment.